Jane Parker. Hello everybody, my name is Ryan Parker and on behalf of Human Kinetics Investors, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. Hopefully you can all see Ian's screen there. This is the third of our four webinars presented by Ian Craig. This one's titled DIY Sports Drinks and Gels That Nourish, Not Deplete. Before we begin, I'd like to just take a few moments to tell you a little bit about today's webinar. It's scheduled to last for about an hour, of which the actual presentation will take around 45 minutes and will be followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. As ever, I have a few questions prepared already from what many of you have already submitted via the sign-in page, emails, and Twitter. If you do think of a question mid-presentation, you can type that into the question box, which is located on the lower right of your screen, and then click send. I will be monitoring these throughout the broadcast, and I'll put as many of them as I can towards Ian at the end of the webinar. We will also be live tweeting during the webinar. We will be using the hashtag DIY Sports Webinar. Feel free to join in using the same hashtag or you can tag us in the tweet at Human Kinetics EU. As with all our webinars, the broadcast is being recorded and will be being made available for download and playback on our website, humankinetics.com. It's usually available within 24 hours, 48 hours the maximum. I'll send you all an email containing the link to the recording when it is available. Today's presenter is Ian Craig, and for those of you that may have missed his first two webinars on integrative and overtraining, I'll um, just like to provide you a little bit of information about him. He's an exercise physiologist, nutritional therapist, NLP practitioner, and an endurance coach. He's also a form, former competitive middle distance runner. Ian specializes in functional sports nutrition, which is a fast evolving discipline that considers both health and performance of an elite athlete from an integrative health perspective. Ian is, the, Ian is the editor of Functional Sports Nutrition magazine and is a conference leader for the Sports Nutrition Live. He's also the author of Wholesome Nutrition. Born in Scotland where he attained his first degree in exercise physiology before moving to North Carolina in the US and London, England to continue his education, he now is in South Africa where he runs a private nutritional therapy practice in Johannesburg. So once again, it gives me great pleasure to hand you over to Ian Craig. Over to you, Ian. Um, sorry, I'm just going to, we've suddenly got a, a shift in slides. <laughs> Let me find the right one. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Ryan, I was on the wrong presentation. Uh -huh. Okay. Phew. When, uh, when the slides didn't appear, I, I got a bit uh, panicked there. All right, so thanks, Ryan, for that uh, introduction. Uh, for those of you who have already um, listened to one of the previous ones, you'll realize that the, the main objective for me as an integrative health practitioner is to work with athletes towards their underlying health. So health forms the basis of, of the pyramid, and then you can build up you, using strategic sports dietetic measures and supplements and ergogenic aids and so on towards performance. Now part of that ergogenic aid potential is sports drinks and they've been around for a long, long time and they've been studied for a long, long time and I use them um, but I prefer to actually make my own as, as you'll start to understand as, as we go through the presentation. So I'm going to start with a bit of a history because we need to look all at the old, um, you know, the old research. And sometimes you'll stand up and do a presentation and bring out a paper from the 1980s and be put down because it's not up to date. But I actually like to see um, how things have moved from those times. And in the 1980s, they still knew how to do good science. You know, you had some famous scientists, so I'm going to refer to a couple of those. So, to start off with, I want to just justify the use of a sports drink. And here we have three different intensities. 25% of VO2 max, and if you know anything about VO2 max, it's pretty much just a walk. 65%, which you would describe as a steady aerobic exercise. 
and eight, then 85. And 85, you're looking at pre, pretty high-intensity cardiovascular exercise. It's not your short duration, but it might be something like a good marathon runner would sit at that pace, or you know, a reasonably good 10K runner would uh, would attain that pace. If you're looking at higher intensity, like five to ten, ten minute efforts, then you're you're going to be sitting at um, probably 100% of VO2 max. Now, fuel substrate, you've got this yellowy orange color at the bottom. That's your plasma glucose, and you can see that's climbing all the way up the intensities. Then plasma free fatty acids, kind of similar between low and medium intensity, and then might actually drop slightly in some people at higher intensities. And then uh, triglycerides in the muscle increase, but then plateau or decrease. But the big thing that increases is your muscle glycogen use. All right. So as intensity increases, you're becoming much more carbohydrate dominant compared to low and medium intensities. And, and I focus so much on this because we're in an era of uh, trying out ketogenic approaches and, you know, is carbohydrate made, all it's made out to be? Well, I just want to remind you of the biochemistry. You know, going through the Krebs cycle, glycolysis is by far the quickest um, biochemical pathway, and therefore you get ATP yielded out of glycolysis much quicker than beta oxidation, which is your fat, um, fat substrate utilization. Here's another example of leg glucose uptake, so millimoles per minute, so it's a rate, and then increasing from similar intensities to the last slide. Um, when you're up at the high intensities, there's a big use of uh, carbohydrate substrate, substrate utilization. Okay, so we can't ignore it. We can't say, right, if I'm, I'm going to become ketogenic and very well fat adapted, you might increase the percentage of VO2 max that you can survive on with fat-only oxidation, but you're never going to hit the high intensities. Right, here's the return to the 1980s that I promised you. Coyle is a well-known author in that era. This was a research study um, where he and his colleagues asked seven trained cyclists to run ride to exhaustion at 71% of VO2 max, or VO2 peak rather, um, on two occasions. One occasion they gave them a glucose polymer solution, and the other was a sweetened placebo. And they were given at 20 minute um, staggers, as uh, 20 minutes in intervals. The subjects who had had the glucose uh, intake during, retained a higher plasma glucose level during. So we're, we're dropping now below three millimoles for plasma glucose without, with this is with the placebo, that's bordering into hypoglycemia. So it's no wonder that they can really uh, uh, continue, and that's after three hours of exercise. So yeah, they did pretty well. But retaining the blood glucose up they managed to get one hour of extra exercise. So this is where you might hear uh, some, uh, you know, sports companies saying, okay, take this uh, sugar solution and it will give you 50% increased time to exhaustion. It's not quite 50%, but it is a big chunk. Here's another one by Coyle and Cogan. Andrew Cogan is well known in the cycling circles. Um, similar thing where both groups were not fed anything until just over two hours in duration, and then they were even either given glucose or a placebo. Glucose pushed the blood, the failing glu blood glucose levels up, and their time to exhaustion increased. The placebo group continued to drop the blood glucose levels again to that dangerously hypoglycemic state. So, this is early research that quite clearly. Um, showed that a glucose solution is far superior to just drinking water in terms of aerobic endurance activity. And here it was at 71% of VO2 peak. Now, in case you, you think, well, that's just, that's fine if you're sitting at 70%. Here's um, one a decade later that was looking at intermittent exercise. So this is another well-known researcher, Davis, 
He looked at seven women and nine men, physically active um, people, who repeated one minute bouts at 120 to 130 percent of VO2 max, separated by three minute rest until fatigue. So you can see in green they took carbohydrate, or in, in blue they took placebo drinks. And they were taken before and every 20, 20 minutes during the exercise. What they found was uh, RPA, heart rate and lactates were higher for the placebo group throughout the trial, i.e. even though they didn't even last as long, they found it harder and yeah, this is a 50% increased time to exhaustion with, with this one minute uh, interval type training. So how much, you know, there, there are pretty clear research studies showing yes we should take some kind of sugar solution, but how much? Um, carbohydrate oxidation has been well studied, it's thought to peak at around one gram per minute, i.e. 60 grams per hour, but upper levels of 1.3 grams a minute have been shown. These are also similar to gastric emptying rates, so by picking this 6% sugar solution, you're actually pretty much maximizing the gastric emptying rate and getting as much as you can of the sugar into your into your system. So just down at the bottom, consuming between half a litre and a litre per hour of a 6% glucose solution will provide 30 to 60 grams per hour, which has been repeatedly shown to improve performance. So now you've got an idea of, yes, they do work. They, um, the solution, the, the concentration that we need, and how much that we can potentially get in over an hour period. So the next question is what kind of carbohydrate? And research has quite clearly uh, looked at different types of sugars, uh, especially glucose, sucrose, maltodextrin, and fructose. So glucose, sucrose, and maltodextrin um, have all achieved uptakes of about one gram per minute, what, what I just mentioned. Sucrose is a glucose fructose uh, dipeptide. Maltodextrin is a, a polypeptide of glucose. Fructose on its own is not as well oxidized, but its uptake mechanism is a bit different from glucose. So it is slower, but as you see in the bottom bullet point here, when fructose is added to a sports drink, it can potentially create a 50% increase in carbohydrate oxidation rate. So just like we said in the previous slide, one gram per minute is usually fairly normal for the average person, but in some cases we can push up to like 1.3 grams per minute. That is uh, achievable if you add the fructose in. So, we're buying up to date now. Well, I almost, this is uh, three years old now, March 2014. Uh, this is a paper from Justin Roberts, who's a researcher and, and a well in England. And he looked at the effect of multidextrin versus multidextrin plus a fructose. So it's something that was tested around the turn of the century, but he was re-looking at it. Um, he recruited 14 club cyclists who performed three trials, uh, which, and each trial was two and a half hours of exercise cycling at 50% of maximum power, followed by a 60 kilometer time trial. So let's see what they found. You'll see on this uh, y-axis, this is an exogenous carbohydrate oxidation, your grams per minute. So here's the one gram per minute, and they were actually achieving higher than that, but only with the fructose. So the key here is placebo is black, the blue is some multidextrin, so that gets up to about one gram per minute, adding in the fructose, again up to 1.3, 1.4 grams per minute. So it can be a good uh, addition. And also with performance, performance times significantly improve with the multidextrin plus fructose compared to the two other trials during that 60k time trial. So yeah, um, this is where science is really useful. It can quite clearly take, divide apart a few sugars and test them out and see what works best and look at some combinations. So 
This stuff I'm not going to argue with. I think it's fairly clear. I'm very interested in physiology. Okay, it's what I'm trained in. It's what I try to um, understand when any elements are going on, whether it's training or food that somebody eats or sports drinks. So why are sports drinks physiologically beneficial? By consuming carbs during exercise, the cortisol response can be moderated and thereby lessening protein breakdown. Elevated cortisol associated with high to, sorry, moderate to high intensity exercise stimulates breakdown of muscle tissue. So if you dialed in last week, well, it was two weeks ago when I did overtraining, I talked a lot about cortisol. Cortisol is a catabolic hormone. We need it, but if we have too much of it over long periods of time, it's very catabolic on our body and it uh, creates a lot of disbalances as well physiologically. Now, we're also in the era of intermittent fasting and getting up uh, out of our sleep and straight away going and exercising in a fasted state. Uh, we're into ketogenic approaches. In small amounts, these are, uh, I should also mention, um, train low, compete high. So train in a low carb um, phase, but compete in a high carb uh, you know, intakes. All of that is all good and well, and we've got plenty of research on it, but if somebody is potentially borderline adrenal fatigue, by getting up in the morning and just going in and exercising in a fasted state, you are going to become more catabolic. You, you, you have to release more cortisol and adrenaline because they're the only way that you can actually break down substrate for energy during your workout. So you need to be very, very respectful of, uh, of this. Uh, molecule called cortisol. This is um, a really epic book, um, Ivy and Portman, called Nutrient Timing in 2004. And there's been a fair amount of stuff since then kind of trying to counter their arguments and so on, but there's some basics that really do stay for me. And, and one of them is the, well, I've just mentioned anabolic catabolic state. That goes along with insulin sensitive versus insulin resistant. So if we go into the exercise, the upper curve is if you're using the right kind of sport strings to stabilize the energy during the, well, provide the substrate during the exercise and, and decrease the catabolic response. This dotted line is without, so you can see that potentially somebody can go into insulin resistance quite soon after exercise if they're not if they're not managing their nutrition needs, whereas they can stay in a, a nice insulin sensitive uh, phase for quite a long period of time. For a top athlete, this is important because um, they want to become anabolic. They want to, as soon as possible, be in an anabolic state after their workout to grow and develop and recover. For a recreational person who's maybe just trying to not get diabetes, well, if they can stay in an insulin sensitive phase, that's great as well. If it's really low intensity exercise, yeah, the sports drinks kind of aren't as important, but um, they do need to manage the timing of food around their exercise so that they're not over reliant on cortisol. Okay, so let's have a little look at hydration and osmolarity, and we're talking about salt here. Studies looking at VO2 max and time trial performance, uh, on average, and this has been in the literature for a long time, more than a 2% loss in body weight from fluid can result in physical and cognitive decline. Now, this bottom one is from Tim Noakes' uh, lab, and he said this figure can range hugely from 1% to 10%. And he mentioned sweat composition, so I'm going to mention that a wee bit more as well. This is a really cool little study where um, researchers looked at the sweating rate depending on running speed and uh, the temperature conditions. So if we look at the upper running speed here, 19.2, it's, it's just over a 30-minute 10K. It, it's quite swift. 9.6, 
it's over an hour, so it's uh, very recreational. So just by running fast, you might be sweating more than two liters an hour, but if you're only running a 10K, hey, that doesn't really matter. Um, but if you're doing a marathon at that pace, some fluid is quite important. But as you'll see when people run marathons, you know, the, the top athletes, they just take little swigs of water. They, they don't upset their stomach. So this is very academic. Um, unless you're looking at longer duration things like a multi-stage race on a bike or um, um, Ironman triathlete, you do need to stay reasonably hydrated through the duration of the day or you're really going to start feeling it. If it's hot and humid, that can go up 50% and the same here. So top athletes tend to underdo the, um, the fluid and get dehydrated. Your recreational athletes, they're in danger of actually uh, going into hyponatremia, i.e. low salt levels, because they guzzle down the water because they've been told that, hey, they need to keep enough water coming in during their event. So during a marathon that might take them five hours, they could actually overhydrate. There are lots and lots of discussions about how much water we need uh, to hydrate. Um, I think it's all very academic because it's going to vary hugely per individual. So I love this resource. Is your urine nice and light? Yes, you're doing well. No, if it looks like apple juice, you're going to need to drink a little bit more. It shouldn't be, you'll see number one is not totally white. It's not totally clear. There should be a little bit of color in there or somebody's drinking too much fluid. So let's look at sweat composition. Some athletes lose very little and some can lose a large amount and you just need to do a spinning class to be able to look at A, the fluid that some people lose. You know, some people have a small uh, garden pond under the spinning bike at the end of the 45-minute uh, session. Others, you know, they might have a, the odd bead of sweat, sweat on, their, on their brow but not much. And then others... You can see in t-shirts, if they've sweated really strongly and then when it starts to dry a bit, you get the white marks, that sweat. So that's an old-fashioned method of uh, assessing sweat. It's like go out and do a, a long, quite hard um, exercise, sweat a lot, you know, do it in the heat, and then let your t-shirt dry, uh, your black t-shirt, let it dry and see how much salt is on it. But we can get a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, there's a process called ionotrophoresis, and you'll see in the references at the end of this presentation um, a guy called Andy Blow, and he wrote an article for me in the FSN magazine a few years ago, and he explains a lot more on this uh, on the science if you're interested. So sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, these are the four electrolytes. We tend to overfocus on sodium. What they all do is maintain fluid homeostasis, cell membrane conduction, nerve transmission, muscle contraction, cognitive function. They're all incredibly important. And you'll lose all of these functions if you go into a hyponitremic state. Magnesium, interestingly, is the most common electrolyte deficiency, as it should say, in athletes. And, uh, you know, there's many side effects for an athlete of having low magnesium. Most, uh, the biggest symptom would be cramping. So this is a, a table from, table from uh, you can drop in uh, Gleason's book in 2011. And it's looking at composition of sweat, composition of the plasma, and composition of uh, intracellular spaces. Sweat has a much higher sodium concentration than potassium. The others are quite low in comparison. The chloride tends to match the sodium levels. Plasma is very similar to that. So um, modern sports drinks tend to mirror the these kind of levels. But intracellularly, potassium levels are much higher than sodium levels. So we need to actually consider that as well. Here's some common sports strengths reported by Ron Mon in 2000. And here's the 6% solution up to 8%. That's considered um, isotonic, i.e. 
the sugar matches the, the body's needs or the body's concentrations. There's the sodium levels higher than the potassium levels. But we're now we've now moved on in our understanding a little bit and there's now debate in the in the research. I don't often mention products but I like this one a lot and I use it a lot so um, I'm, I'm happy to share it. It's just simply a very concentrated salt solution in a bottle and you do a little squirt into your water bottle. So they actually have, and it's from it's salt from the Great Lakes and they uh, add in a little bit more magnesium and it's fairly equal concentrations between potassium and sodium. Now, talking to the guy that runs this uh, company in the UK, he says that some of the um, pro cycling teams are now using more equal ratios between sodium and potassium and they're getting good results. He also, um, he's keen on us not neglecting the intracellular high potassium levels. So it's, it might not just be a case of trying to match the salt that's lost through the this, this sweat, but actually having good potassium levels might increase the uh, the way the body retains the water. And I'm sure you've all experienced this. You have a, a big glass of water and five minutes later you're in the loo. Um, it's just had a good flushing effect of, of the kidneys. But when you're trying to hydrate for sport, you want to keep a lot of that in. Yes, you still want to push the toxins out of the, through the kidneys, but uh, you want to retain some as well. So there are arguments that potassium should be higher. And also the magnesium, you just saw some important functions of that. It's uh, hugely important in the Krebs cycle. Okay, so let's start. Let's leave the science a wee bit behind and uh, let's get into considering actual drinks. So this is a very representative picture of modern drinks. And I was once uh, slagging off um, certain brands of drinks in a lecture at uh, Stellenbosch University and the guy in the front, <laughs> front row was lifting up a bright orange bottle uh, as I spoke and uh, he got uh, quite a lot of attention from, from everyone else. If you want to glow in the dark, drink these drinks. If you want to actually be healthy, then stay tuned. As I said earlier, I'm into health. Anything that is not nutritive to the body must be detoxified. So we're talking about flavors, colors, preservatives, sweeteners. Some sports drinks have all of these things. Um, we don't want them. Detox requires a greater supply of ATP than any other biochemistry, uh, biochemical process in the body. Okay, so it's energy heavy. So therefore, you're trying to get the sugar to plug into your crab cycle and give you some ATP, but you're using some of that ATP to do the liver processes. Um, it's not really the most effective way. All right? And the other thing I've noted down here is gastrointestinal issues are extremely prevalent in sport, and these colored flavored whatever um, drinks are, are certainly partially to blame. I myself could certainly not do an Ironman on something high in sweeteners and flavors. You know, just get a dodgy stomach after a few hours. So I wanted just to back, out, back this up and I uh, went looking for research. Um, so since some people use mice or rats to um, back up what their thoughts are, I thought I'd use cows because it was the only research study that sort of came, came up um, quickly. But basically this study is saying that the gastrointestinal tract and liver are responsible for a disproportionately high fraction of whole body energy utilization. Obviously that's in cows and chewing animals. They, they will use a bit more than us. But it's just to make the point. Think about what you're consuming. It's not just the sugar. Don't take in things that you actually don't need. So to, to be clean, and this was when I was an athlete, this is what I did. Um, I knew I didn't like the, a lot of the commercial drinks, so I made my own. I just bought some multidextrin and mixed it with uh, 
filtered water, which is the Brita filter, and I use a reverse osmosis filter, a pinch of salt. Um, in those days, I didn't have a lead, so I just used some, uh, some salt. And then maybe a bit of fructose powder that you can buy in a, uh, in a health shop. Add a little bit more, um, and we're going to discuss it a wee bit later, um, an amino acid in the, in the drink, glutamine I, I like a lot, branch chain amino acids I like a lot, and maybe some uh, vitamin C powder if you want, if you're going a bit further or you're going intense, um, and maybe even some magnesium powder. These are all things that you can layer into a drink, as long as it is palatable and your stomach puts up with it for a reasonable amount of time. But now I go a little bit more functional, and the word functional means you're actually putting into the body what you're trying to achieve in terms of health outcomes. So this is functional for health, not just put in sugar and therefore get a performance outcome, but put in something that actually gives you a little bit more than the sugar. So you get the sugar and you're getting some other stuff. So let's have a look at some research. So cherry juice has been around for a few years. Uh, it kind of was more led from the from the product, very concentrated cherry extract. They looked at uh, rugby, football players, and martial artists who took a cherry extract for 10 days. On day eight, they did heavy leg extension exercises, and then they looked at recovery phases. So the recovery was better, it wasn't massively better, but they were able to measure less exercise induced oxidative muscle damage. And this is a big theme on its own, uh, oxidative stress during exercise. Um, but if you can lessen it a little bit, that's great, and there's been a lot of research since then, and it's become quite common to find cherry juice. Around the same time, um, Andy Jones at uh, in Exeter was looking at beetroot juice, and that's now become pretty much famous. Um, he's one of the most uh, followed people in science on social media now, so he, he's the beetroot man. Basically, they loaded up, a, I think it was half a litre a day for a week. On average, subjects cycled for 16% longer after, yeah, uh, half a litre for, for six days. Further research demonstrated that beetroot juice may decrease oxygen consumption while doing exercise. Um, we now know that beetroot and various other vegetables contain the nitrates, and nitrates are vasodilating, so you're actually potentially increasing the blood flow to the, to the active tissues during exercise. Then, digging into some, uh, some more recent ones, uh, I came across sugarcane juice, so that's quite interesting. Um, and what they found was that it was equally as effective as a sports drink during exercise and a more effective rehydration drink because it enhanced muscle glycogen resynthesis. Sugar cane, if you go to somewhere like Singapore, you can, you can buy sugar cane and they put it through a press and, and you get sugar cane juice. And that's pretty natural. We're not talking about the refined sugar that comes from sugar cane. It's a different thing. It's going to retain minerals and so on. Then we've got this uh, honey drink. Uh, I love honey myself, so it caught my attention. They found, oh, sorry, let me just give you the, the, the run one information to start with. In run one, subjects were required to run on a treadmill at 65% of VO2 max in the heat for an hour, so i.e. Re, uh, dehydrating. Then they had a two-hour rehydration phase where they drank either plain water or the, or the honey drink. And then they, they did run, run two where they were trying to cover the longest distance possible in 20 minutes, right? So they found that the honey drink um, meant that people, the subjects ran um, 3.4 kilometers compared to 3.1 kilometers with the plain water. So clearly better, just like the old trials on um, glucose drinks, clearly better 
they need to now compare it with um, you know standard sports strengths to to take this research a bit further. And then another interesting one: cashew apple juice. Now. It's been shown that diets containing antioxidants and branched-chain amino acids are thought to have improved or potential effects on fat utilization. And of course, we're in an era of trying to boost fat utilization by maybe restricting carbs. So this would be quite interesting because apple juice is hardly low in carbs. So cashew apple juice comprises nutritional components including vitamin C, antioxidant, and BCAs. So what did they find? There were lower carbohydrates and higher fat oxidation rates and contributions to total energy after the cashew apple juice compared to the placebo. So great. And this is uh, in trained people and untrained people. This is the carb oxidation rate. So white is before supplementation, black is after supplementation. The placebo in, in all cases didn't make much difference, but supplementation of the cashew apple juice decreased carb oxidation rate in trained and untrained people and increased fat oxidation rate quite hugely actually in both trained and untrained. So this is quite significant in that if we can stimulate better fat oxidation rate without going into these restrictive low carb approaches, um, that's a good thing. So I think more should be done on this one. Here's a few more research studies, fairly, fairly up to date ones, uh, the kind of stuff that people are looking at. And then here's one on deep mineral water. So deep mineral water is water that contains a lot of minerals and they can, can compared it to standard plain water. And what they found was that it's more effective in inducing recovery of aerobic capacity and leg muscle power compared to plain water. Um, and that was after a dehydrating aerobic running exercise. So why did I share this? It's not a sports drink, but just by the water you choose can make a huge difference. So we don't all have access to these fancy deep mineral waters or uh, oxygenated or ozonated waters or whatever it may be, but we can filter our water and add in a little bit of uh, the right balance of electrolytes. Okay, so now we're on to the, the fun bit. This is, uh, this is the bloggers, and, and I've just picked a few that I quite liked. So here's the watermelon workout uh, drink. So it's very much watermelon with uh, coconut water. Here's cherry lemon. So cherry juice, lemon juice, and honey. And each of them are adding salt. Cranberry. So you got some cranberry juice, um, water, salt, and here it's um, sweetened with the maple syrup. Chia seeds. So there's some directions here. You can make up your chia seeds into a gel and you, you mix it with a juice of your choice. So it could be grape juice or cranberry juice or something. Um, and then here's one where they look at a few different options. So you can, um, you can browse through this stuff again and, and see what suits you, but depending on your taste, you can take a basic recipe and mix it together. So she was actually doing a coconut water as a base and then adding in the flavor of her choice. The only thing I didn't like about her recipes is the sugar-free simple syrup. I don't see the point of having sugar-free or sweetener options in a sports drink. You need to get the sugar in, so by default it should be sweet. Lemon barley water, this gives me memories of uh, like old English lawn tennis or something. Um, so I thought I'd look it up and see what uh, see what's used. So here's pearl bar barley, lemons, uh, honey, and water. Now, from all these blogged items, I haven't analyzed them for their carbohydrate content or their salt content, but I thought I'd just share them, them with you so you know what kind of stuff is out there. So I'm going to now go into a little section where I share with you the kind of thinking I have around making sports drinks. And I don't do anything fancy, 
and I try to be quite strategic with that carbohydrate solution, the 6% balance. Okay, so this was what, this was apple juice in my fridge at the weekend, and what am I going to look for? Per 100 mil, we have 14 grams of sugar. So apple juice, we need to multiply the 100 by 10 to get a liter, that means you've got 140 grams of sugar in your um, in your apple juice for a liter. That's too much. That's 14%. So apple juice, we need to actually divide half with water. Here's pomegranate juice. The either counts is a little bit lower, um, so not quite as much sugar per same serving, and We'll, we'll also look at how to divide that up as well. Here's honey, so honey label, so it's showing how much fructose and glucose was in it, and I basically divided out the water and came up with about 80% of honey is sugar, and um, that's my honey, they're going to vary. This is a really good local raw honey, and uh, I recommend it. If you can get raw, go for it. And then here's coconut water. So half a uh, quarter liter portion size, you get 12 grams of carbs. And I just wanted to point out, it's got quite high potassium levels there compared to the, the sodium being 50 grams. So these, this is the detail you need to go into if you're gonna make your own drinks. You need to actually have a look and do some calculations in your head and figure out how to put it together. But I'm gonna help you. So first thing we wanna look at is what is the glucose fructose sucrose ratio? You already know that we want to have more glucose than we do fructose in a drink, but sucrose is also a good, um, uh, a well metabolized carbohydrate choice. It's one of the faster ones, that plus multidextrin. But you don't get multidextrin in fruit juices. So apple juice, it's kind of low in the glucose and kind of high in the fructose. So it's not the ideal choice. Pomegranate is a bit more, see, if we combine the glucose and the sucrose, which are the, the favorable ones, you get 53 to 47. So it's a better ratio. Here's the cherry, it's similar. There's coconut water, and that's actually very good. And a lot of people have blogged about coconut water being a really good sports drink. Um, I agree, it's, a, it's very nice. The, the one I have is um, it's in one liter of coconut water you would have 40 grams of sugar so we'll round that off to percent solution so a little bit, little bit dilute but we'll come back to that and then here's your honey uh, so you know fairly similar kind of um, glucose fructose ratio so not bad potential and if we take 75 grams of it and make it up to a liter, there's a, there's a 6% solution. Now, with this information, if you're truly, truly trying to mimic the scientific studies and get a performance gain and you're trying to get the, the higher glucose to fructose ratio, then my first choice would be coconut water, my second choice would be pomegranate juice. But if you're actually more just training and you particularly like the taste of apple juice, then mix up the uh, dilute the apple juice and, and use it. If you like honey, dilute that down and use it, and I'm gonna show you how in a minute. These are the dilutions that you'd make in terms of uh, how much sugar is in a liter of apple juice. You need to do a 50-50 balance. Pomegranate is a little bit more pomegranates and a little bit less uh, water. Here is, this is Cherry Active that all the research trials were originally done on. It's very concentrated, so you'd use it like honey and just make it up to a liter. And then coconut water, full strength, raw honey, dilute it and make, uh, sorry, yeah, dilute it with your water. This is a, this is a good resource. Um, Lauren Cardin wrote the book, The Paleo Diet, and he also wrote the book, The Paleo Diet for Athletes. And he's looked at a bunch of different foods. There's a lot of fruit in here. And looking at the glucose, fructose, sucrose concentrations. And, and also total sugar per amounts. So it's quite a good resource. So you've got the website there you can refer to. 
So here's a few of my sample recipes. The first one, um, I got the idea when I, when I did this 200 kilometer cycle race in the heat several years ago. We had a backup vehicle and at 160 k's after pushing one of my team members up some hills. I was exhausted and this guy handed me a, a chilled bottle of iced tea and it was the most glorious thing I'd drunk all day having had this, you know, supposedly perfectly balanced um, sports drink all day. But it glowed in the dark and it made me feel quite nauseous after, you know, three, four hours. So what you can do is brew up green or rooibos tea. I've chosen those two because they're particularly high in antioxidants. Rooibos is what we say in, uh, in South Africa for red bush, right? So red bush tea. Stir in 75 grams of raw honey or 60 grams of coconut sugar, which will give you another sugar base. If you like the honey taste, that's great. If you're not so keen on it, the coconut sugar is a, a lesser taste, but the same amount of sugar. Pomegranate juice, just diluted with water, as I said before. Uh, the coconut water, as I mentioned, it doesn't quite hit the 6%, <clears throat> so I did some calculations and figured out if you go for three quarters of a litre coconut water mixed with a quarter of a litre of a fruit juice like pomegranate, it works well. Now the other good fruit juice is grape juice. Uh, I like that. It's palatable. I personally use apple, grape and pomegranate and they, and they work well. What you can also add in is the, the squirt of elite electrolytes to taste. You've already learned that uh, electrolytes, unless you get it scientific measure, scientifically measured, you don't really know what your demands are. So go by taste, that's a good, uh, good rule of thumb. And if you, you know you sweat a lot of salt, add a little bit more in. And then there's the glutamine powder if you want a little bit more. Okay, so the last little section is gels. And there's not much research to mention about gels because, read this in red, they're simply concentrated sports strings that need to be diluted with water to be the same concentration as a sports drink. If you don't follow this information, you'll get it wrong. And unfortunately, they don't write this on packages and some of the sports gels um, actually say you can have it on its own without any water and, um, I have so, in, so many instances when people come to see me saying, Phew, I got nauseous and my stomach cramps during this half Ironman. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. And I go through and they're taking gels concentrated without enough water. So basically, if you have, most gels are plus or minus 20 grams of carbohydrate. Look at the total carbs and forget about the sugars because the, it's very, fairly academic how they divide carbs and sugars. So a 20 grams, 20 grams is a third of the 60 grams that I told you you need to have for a liter sports drink, right? So a 6% uh, 6 sports drink is 60 grams of sugar in within a liter of water. So it's just the same. 20 grams would mean a third of a liter. So it's quite a lot. Uh, that would surely cause some gastric distress, just too much water. So what I suggest is that people squirt in half of the gel or even a third of the gel, follow it down with 100, 150 mils of water, and then a, few, uh, a little while later, take the other half gel. It's much more easy on the stomach. I've selected two products that I thought were quite good, and I just want to mention their constituents. So. Thankfully, we're in an era where we can get some nice commercial products that are made of real ingredients. So here we have dates, water. Here's a proprietary blend of grape juice and uh, rice dextrins. Dextrins just means glu glucose, essentially. Sogum malt, that's a grain. An electrolyte blend, a bit of coconut oil. Um, citric acid, which is a mild preservative, naturally, natural raspberry and strawberry flavors. Um, I'd prefer they actually ground down the raspberries and strawberries and put that in themselves, but it would make it a lot more expensive and the shelf life would be a lot shorter. Um, so 
per 45 gram gel, so it's a very big gel, they get 22 grams of carbs, one gram of fat, half a gram of protein. And you can see the potassium is quite high. So just by choosing fruits as opposed to a synthetic kind of man-made product, you're naturally getting higher potassium levels. I like this. Um, it's got nice high carb levels and low fat and protein. Fat and protein is higher to, harder to digest, especially when you're going really high intensity. So for this, I would say, say you got a hundred kilometer or a hundred mile uh, road cycle, and it takes you three to four hours, or maybe a bit longer. This would be nice because you you want to keep a good intensity. If you're doing it more recreationally slower, you can you can look at something like this. This is based on chia seeds, coconut, palm sugar, and some, some flavor from vanilla. Per gel, it's a much lower carb count and a much higher fats and protein count. So if you're going high intensity, you need to check yourself out. Can you digest this well? That, the answer might be yes, but for some of you, you won't. So just be mindful and try it out. Um, but definitely for longer distances. Chia seeds became famous uh, after the book Born to Run, where the Mexican Indians ran miles and miles, you know, hours and hours through the desert just using chia seeds. They had a little uh, sack of chia seeds that they carried with them. So it is a superfood, if you want to call it that. Here's a, here's a blog that I picked up, and this guy, he's quite funny. He said... Um, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a doctor, I think I passed my 101 biology, um, but I'm enthusiastic and this works for me, so here you go, uh, try it if you like. So honey is the base of the sugar with molasses, or you can use agave, agave's got slightly less flavor than the honey, there's the chia seeds, there's some water, salt, and coffee, right, so a lot of gels, are caffeinated to try and give the extra kick. This is an uh, added optional if you want to do it for his particular gel. So without the coffee added in per 70 grams, he, he had 35 grams of carbs, a little bit of fat, a little bit of protein. So not a bad mixture. And I think he's done pretty well for an amateur. Uh, higher sodium levels actually in this one. Um, but still good potassium levels, and you add in the coffee, and uh, what you need to do is just know that there might be a little Ziploc bag or something you use to, to hold this in, know that per Ziploc bag you get 35 grams of carbs, and therefore overall you need to balance it with about half a litre of, of water. Okay, so this is my last bit of blabbing on. This is Andy Blow, the, the guy I mentioned earlier, and I love his quote. Overall, what is clear in terms of how athletes should approach hydration and electrolyte placement is that optimal performance is likely to stem from following a strategy based on your, your individual physiology, the demands on, of your sport, and the environmental conditions. The body does not tend to respond well to being extremely deficient in anything, but neither does it have an infinite capacity to deal with excess. In other words, find your own balance. And as always, there's a few references you can chase down. Uh, I just want to thank um, Simone de Carmel from Personal Best Nutrition. She's helped me with research and putting some slides and so on together. And I'll hand back to Ryan. Thanks, Ian. Great insight again, as always. Um, I'll crack start with the questions because we have had a few uh, questions from the listeners. Um, I know you spoke a little bit about sugar, and we've had a few questions about sugar as well. Um, Mark, who owns a supplement company here in the UK, says, many personal trainer courses in their nutrition section suggest energy drinks are merely sugar and water, hence a waste of money. Also on that subject, Amanda, who's a basketball coach in Canada, asks if there are any sugar-free options. Would you recommend sugar-free options? And what would you say to Marcos and his PT classes? Um, correct. That most sports drinks are just sugar and water and uh, kind of expensive for what you get. 
but hopefully by the end of the presentation you'll understand the importance of the sugar and the water but hopefully you're now a little bit more informed with how to choose it don't just go with you know table sugar and water it's an option but there are much better options now so like you can mix some honey and water and forget all the colors the flavorings that's the real problem with sports drinks um, but look at the biochemistry of what we need to do look at the biochemistry of the sports that you yourself are doing or um, or your clients are doing if it's a, a basic personal training client who's just trying to lose some weight and, and you actually can't really get them to much intensity in the gym then yeah, a little bit of coconut water would be not a bad idea because um, it's not strong concentrated in sugar but don't load them with sports drinks that, that's quite counterproductive but if you get somebody exercising hard especially for long duration it's a good idea um, and I should quantify duration as well anything above an hour you will find athletes naturally going for sports drinks and that's well uh, backed up by science but if you if you get a an event under under an hour generally just a little bit of water is enough to keep things ticking over okay great thanks Ian um, I've had a question through on Twitter which I think is quite an interesting one um, it's put if competing in a fast it's from a guy called Alex by the way on Twitter so thanks for your question Alex it's put if competing in a fasted state is carb mouth rinse adequate on the moder moderating cortisol response Excellent. Sorry, it's what adequate? I missed that word. Um, is the is the carb mouth rinse is it adequate in moderating cortisol response? That's his question. Okay, so you you're competing in a fasted state. Um, in terms yeah. of the body's ability to recruit its own carbohydrates or, or pull out from storage, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's going to put a much higher demand on cortisol and you can see from you know away from the 80s all the way to the present day certain reasonably high intensities for you know two to three hour durations you can get a much higher um, time to exhaustion or you can sit a higher percent of your two max for longer um, with the carb drink just because you're adding an extra um, source of energy to come in that's quite easy to access otherwise you're dependent on yeah the stress hormones trying to activate glycolysis activate free fatty acids mobilization so I wouldn't advise competing on in a fasted state even I've never even seen any research um, backing that up even even the, the diehard researchers who are into ketosis um, what I would say is you can train in a fasted state if you're very careful with balancing adrenal fatigue and overtraining, uh, but not the high intensity stuff. Keep the high intensity with uh, a little bit of fuel coming into the body. Do the lower intensity stuff in a fasted state where the intensity is down low enough that the fat oxidation is enough, and then you are going to, to uh, boost the fat oxidation capacity. Okay. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, thanks Ian. Um, this is a question for myself. Um, you didn't mention much about protein with amino acids in the presentation and I often see protein shakes containing amino acids these days. Um, should we be adding protein to some of the sports drinks you spoke about, for example, should we combine protein with amino acids such as glutamine? And if so, when, when should we digest this? Is, is there any benefit to taking it before and during exercise as well? Okay, thanks Ryan. This is a um I had a few slides in on that and then decided uh, uh, I'm going to run over time on this one. So I'll give you a sort of abbreviated response. Scientists are still kind of, you know, trying to debate this one out and there's not a clear answer. Um, if, you, if you're talking about reasonably short duration and reasonably short duration in terms of sports drinks, you're looking at about three hours and below, I don't believe there's any real uh, value performance-wise to putting protein or amino acids in sports drinks um, just because you're in such a high turn, turnover of the carbs but 
Longer duration, yes, I, I do believe there may be a performance benefit. So these multi-stage races or a half Ironman or an Ironman, yeah, definitely get some uh, glutamine powder, get some BCAs into the drink. Now, that's from a performance perspective because it just takes the edge off the, the cortisol requirements. Um, from a recovery perspective, yeah, I would definitely put glutamine powder into fairly short duration efforts. Even an interval session that lasts under an hour, have a sports drink handy, and you can just have a little sip now and then and definitely finish it off after your, after your session. And the protein has actually been shown to, or amino acids at least, have been shown to perpetuate the insulin response after meaning your uptake of glycogen or your, your replenishment of glycogen is faster than just getting in carbs themselves. So that's a no-brainer, but also you're getting the um, protein required for muscle replenishment as soon as possible. And you're, the fact you've got sugar combined with that and the better insulin response means you get the protein to the right places quicker as well. So yes, I believe strongly that uh, we should have them in. Um, if you're doing a quite high intensity race and you're not sure about how your belly will cope with a bit of, um, could be glutamine powder, or it could be BCAs, although they're quite hard to mix. Uh, it could be um, a whey isolate, which is quite easy to digest. Try it out, you have to try it in training. Uh, you don't want to get a, a funny stomach during the race. Okay, I agree. That's uh, helpful, thanks. Um, I'll ask a couple more questions. I know we've, we've hit four o'clock mark here in the UK, but I'll just ask a couple more questions because we have had a lot come in. Um, a lot of questions through mid-presentation saying, could we consider adding caffeine to sports drinks to be ingested during exercises? That's from Ricardo. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question and, and I'm glad you brought that up. Caffeine has been well researched with regards to being an ergogenic aid. So a sports drink itself, as you can see from these slides, is an ergogenic aid. Caffeine itself is an ergogenic aid. But we're now in the era of genetics, and some people detoxify caffeine really quickly and therefore need quite big amounts, and others uh, detox it very slowly. Um, and if they go with the average recommendations, they can actually become over-aroused. So there's a kind of inverted U model in terms of arousal and performance. So yeah, treat caffeine with caution. Um, you could even do, um, you know, remember I did that iced tea option. You could even do an iced coffee option. Uh, that would, for some people, be a really delicious sports drink. Um, just... I'm not going to give you figures because some will do well on it, some will, it won't be enough, some it won't be, it'll be too much. So you need to play around with it, read a little bit around the subject. Uh, you generally, to use coffee, um, I like to do like an espresso an hour before a race. If you're a fast metabolizer, it might be a double espresso half an hour before a race, you know, like an endurance event. But, mm -hmm. but even short duration, it's very good for um, focus if you get the amount right. Um, and coffee is uh, very commonly found in gels, and I don't see any issue with putting it in sports drinks. It's the, it's the same deal. Okay, great stuff. I've had um, a couple of questions on young athletes as well. Um, one here from gymnastics coach says, is there anything specific for young athletes? Is there anything they should avoid, um, which you may recommend for an adult, i.e. can young children have amino acids and glutamine um, supplements, are there any known side effects, for example, or should children just be encouraged to just have a good balanced diet and stay away from any supplementation? Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, as I repeatedly say, I'm focused more on health, so I really hate children being separated out from adults in terms of what we should eat. You go into a restaurant and there's two menus. Um, if it's healthy for an adult, it should be health, healthy for a kid because it's whole food. Same with drinks. Now, I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and they both love coconut water. They, they both love diluted pomegranate juice, and that's almost just the strategy to get them to drink more water in the day so they're not dehydrated. So 
if a few years pass and one of them or both of them get into a, a sport, there's no problem with the diluted pomegranate juice. If they get a little bit more rig, uh, vigorous into the sports, we can start adding a bit of uh, glutamine for recovery and stuff like that. But I'd say that the, the need is less for the added amino acids just because compared to the adults who are you know, seriously training, their intensities will be a bit lower and their volumes of work will be less. So yes, food first, get the balances right, focus on health of food, but hey, some DIY health, uh, sports drinks, absolutely. Um, brightly colored sports drinks, absolutely not. So I hope that so answers that one. Yeah, just going back to what you were saying there about adults working more intense. So for example, if you know, you've got your sort of like recreational athlete who might do a few runs here and there, maybe go to the gym once or twice a week. Do you think they don't necessarily need these additional amino acids? Or? It depends on their goals. So if they're just people that you see in the gym kind of going through the paces, they're not really getting the intensities up high enough. Yeah. Those initial slides I showed you, you know, the 85% VO2 max, mm. They might periodically get into that state and then they hang around talking to their friends for five minutes. Um, no, the need's not particularly there, although something like a coconut water is pretty much something you could take sedentary, so there's no harm in that. Um, but somebody who goes twice a week and really works hard for an hour and they're trying to put a wee bit of muscle on, they're trying to get a high intensity uh, in each session and they're, and they're trying to progress, yes. Absolutely. For weight training, I would say a sports drink definitely with some amino acids in it because they're not having to, you know, do this continual aerobic exercise where the, the stomach, the GI problems would be such a, uh, such a problem. Um, so, yeah, is it recreational? Is it hard recreational? They're, they're the questions. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we Just going back to when you were talking about um, sweat, I had a a message come through um, through the webinar saying um, why are equal levels of potassium and sodium required although sweat rates are a lot lower in potassium? It's, um, it's a good question. It's um, the, the simple way is looking at okay how much are we actually losing from the body um, but this sort of it's not even research coming out. This really needs to be unfolded, and uh, I don't have all the answers myself for sure. It's trying to look at the intracellular levels and also what is more naturally coming from natural foods. So um, fruits and so on are much more evenly balanced between sodium and potassium. And if we can actually get a little bit more into the intracellular space, you might get better absorption of the water that you're consuming. Whereas if the intracellular spaces are a little bit depleted in potassium, for example, you might not get as much absorption intracellularly. Um, and that's a hydration issue. Um, and also it's a sodium potassium pump issue. So um, the, the nerves re rely on that sodium potassium pump. So um, cramping could be a consideration there. So I'm a little bit vague just because I don't know all the ins and outs and, and I'm not you know, involved in that research, but it does need to be pulled out more. Um, I am convinced enough that just doing a high sodium solution is not the answer, but I don't know whether we should be going higher potassium or just having a nice balance. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm just going to um, ask one more question. Um, I'm actually going to combine two questions because I've had um, some questions on like sport-specific things come through. So um, a lady called Kim has asked, what would you recommend for swimmers training twice a day for four hours in total? And somebody called Sebastian has also sent a, um, a question through saying, um, do your recommendations apply equal to sports with anaerobic bursts such as basketball and direct adaptations needed so just like adaptations needed for different sports for example said someone who's swimming for four hours a day or someone who's playing you know a basketball game where there's just short bursts of jumping yeah. would you recommend different drinks yeah not different drinks just different ap applications of it um so look at the me 
biochemical demands of the sport. So swimming, to, you know, a two-hour bout twice a day is a lot. You know, swimmers sometimes cover several kilometers on a day. So the actual fuel needs of that swimmer are really, really high. Through the diet, you need to try and get the, the fat metabolism up to cope with the, the baseline energy. But I'd definitely be using a sports drink like this. And, and normally I suggest roughly half a liter an hour during a training situation. It depends on whether they've done like half an hour warm up with all the swimming drills and half an hour cool down and, and an hour of kind of active training or whether it's pretty much two hours of active training. They're, they're the questions to ask, how much I would recommend. But certainly the 6% solution uh, and get in as much as they need. You'll, you'll never overdo the need because, um, let me get my information, 60 grams of sugar, which would be a liter of drink, gives you four times that amount, which is 240 calories. So if, if you're a good swimmer really pushing the pace, you're going to be up towards 1,000 calories an hour of effort. You, you're getting nowhere near that, and that's from a liter of drink. So yes, thinking about that, I would actually recommend a liter across the two hours, uh, at least. Basketball, yeah, it's, um, it's high intensity bouts and then easier periods. Yeah, it would just be more um, like a grazing type scenario I think with a sports drink. So have it in the in the stands and coming off between bouts you can have a sip or two and, and just go more with feel. Um, so if it's a serious high intensity keep going keep going with fairly short recoveries then more is required if it's very recreational on and off the pitch sorry the, the, the basketball field um, Sorry, pitch. Is that the right one? Uh, court. Basketball court. Sorry. <laughs> if you're on and off the court, um, then, yeah, you don't need so much. If you're really pushing it, come off and have a good guzzle. And uh, just treat it as matching your fluid needs. So a liter across two hours or half a liter across an hour is not a, a massive amount. And you might drink that anyway sitting at your computer. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, we have I've got a few more questions, but I'm just going to leave it there because we have overrun by by quite a bit already. So apologies if um, I haven't had time to answer your question. Um, as as previously mentioned earlier, this as our third webinar of four part series with Ian, and we'll also be back next week. Um, that webinar is titled "A Case Study of an Adrenaline Fee Fatigued Nutri Nutrient Depleted Professional Athlete." Um, more information on that can be found on our website or our blog, which I'll send everyone a link to. Um, just a reminder that the clocks go forward in the UK on Sunday, so the webinar will still be at 3 p.m. UK time, but if you're watching outside the UK, just please bear that in mind. Um, also, if you've missed any of this webinar or you want to catch up on the other two webinars, which you might have missed as well, um, they are all available on our website at humankinetics.com forward slash webinars. Um, you'll also find all those old webinars on there as well. Um, so finally, I'd just like to Thank everybody who signed up and tuned into this webinar, whether you're listening live or via the recording on the Human Connects website. I'd also like to thank Ian for another fantastic presentation. I'd also like to mention, also got you, that Human Kinetics now have 12 bases approved courses. So if your bases member and need them extra CPD points, please take a look at our, all our courses on um, our website. If you type in humanconnects.com forward slash bases, you'll see all the endorsed courses there. Um, also, just before you leave, can I please ask you to take a few moments when the webinar window closes to complete a short survey on today's webinar. Your feedback is much appreciated, and I do read everyone's comments. Um, so, yeah, so keep an eye out for me, for an email from me, which I will um, send you the recording with information of next week's webinar as well. That should be with you within, hopefully within 24 hours, 48 hours is, is the maximum. Um, so, yeah, that's it. I'm now going to end the webinar. So, um, thanks, everyone, again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye.